Now there is a game that's considered one of the most intellectual board games in the world, and that is chess. Due to its endless possibilities of openings, gameplay, and endings. The nature of the game is that each more or each move produces numerous possible continuations. Every door has several more doors waiting behind it, which is why this game is still considered one, if not the most popular games in the world. Now, each piece on a chessboard has a unique role, and if you relate it with what they do with society today, the analogies are quite interesting. When researching this, I came across an article, which is chessanalogy.blogspot.com, and I went on there and made sure it was still in existence, and it is. But it does talk about each piece. So the rooks, which are the castles, which are the outside of the chessboard, these are straightforward in everything they do. They are much like a cannon. People notice this piece and believe that it can do big things. They are often the first to be noticed when moved and are often straightforward in the way of thinking. You can relate this to entire nations, like famous sport players or historical figures or even close friends. The knights, which is the second piece in, these are the horses. And they are uh, circular in their way of thinking and they're not easily confined in a box or by a box because they can jump over opponents or to get to their spot. Of all the pieces, they seem to go about things differently. And these pieces could be the creators or the inventors and the like. The bishops, next one in, third one in, these are the runners. And they are much like sharpshooters. Everything they do is targeted. They are so targeted at times that they have they had to have two bishops just to cover all the spaces. These could be calculated as very targeted people that see their target and nothing else. The queens, they have an important role. Now, there's only one queen, but they have an important role, and they are often noticed, and therefore, they have a lot of responsibility. They are the multitaskers. They are often put into positions where they have to do more than one thing at the same time. An example of this could be a CEO, for example, of a company. Now the king is on top. These are the ones that somehow revert back to the movement of pawns, of a pawn speed physically, because they can only do one move at a time at one space. Only because they are directed by so much traffic. The king can move in every direction, but can only do one spot at a time. Now, these are the people who would freely give their life for them. For example, presidents and historically strong figures. The front line are eight pieces, and they are the pawns. They don't have all the arsenal of the bigger pieces, yet they are the first ones out to battle. They are restricted in a lot of ways and are often considered the weakest piece at first glance. He is the unit of the lowest value and normally the most expendable. They are the common man trying to make it in life, the office worker that's fighting to make ends meet, the construction worker, the factory worker. This is you and me. He is the most basic unit. His movement and capturing power can be traced directly to the lowest ranked soldiers of the armies of the 15th and 16th centuries of when chess was, came into existence. However, his worth increases as he travels up the board because a pawn that reaches the other side of the chessboard gets to promote and can end up winning the game simply by outlasting the other major pieces. It is said that the skill of a true grand master of chess is tested not by the way he or she moves his king, but by the way a pawn chess piece is moved. So with this background, I would like to focus on the pawn. As there are eight pawns on a chessboard, and I'll also use its analogy in terms of eight individuals in the Bible, how God chose the average common man 
to be used by him to do his work and to fulfill his purpose. Of course, there's a lot more examples I could use, but I wanted to do just eight since I'm giving a sermon net. And because there's eight pieces on the board of a chessboard, which are pawns. The first one was a story of Joseph. And we know about Joseph in Genesis 37, which is incredible if you think about and read about what he went through in life. He was sold into slavery by his brothers, but God was with him. When he was faced with a trial, he had a choice to make when Potiphar's wife tried to seduce him. She then accused Joseph of attempting to take advantage of her as he fled, and as a result was then thrown into jail. But Joseph had a special talent where he then interprets both the dreams of the butler and the baker, and the news eventually gets to Pharaoh, who also has a dream that no one could interpret. So Joseph explains the dream, but not by his own power, but putting all the glory to God for this gift. And as a result, Joseph becomes a Pharaoh's right-hand man. Joseph can interpret dreams, and he saves Egypt from a famine. Before that, Joseph was two things that weren't great by any means. He started his life in Egypt as a slave, and then he became a prisoner in jail too. The second one is Moses, and he started off as a shepherd. Of course, he then became a prince of Egypt, but as we know, when he found out what his true identity was, he fled. And so later on in the story, then God called to Moses in the burning bush in Exodus 3. And he gave him specific instructions on what to do. Now, even though Moses hesitated at first, God saw to it that his request would be carried out. God was going to use Moses by any means possible. Sometimes when we are called to do something and we don't want to do it, there's always a way that God is going to come right back to make sure you do it, just like what happened with Jonah. So anyway, Moses then goes to Egypt and confronts Pharaoh with, with his brother Aaron. And they go through the plagues, and in chapter 12, the Passover and days 11 bread is instituted. The Ten Commandments were also given to Moses for the people to know God's law, which was then set in stone. The annual holy days were clearly revealed in conjunction with Moses to establish the nation of Israel as God's people. Now, we do not read in Scripture that they were revealed or established prior to that time. But it is clear that true uh, Christians, spiritual Israelites, as we are today, are to keep all of God's feasts today, which is his weekly Sabbath as well as the annual holy days. Leviticus 26 tells us how we should and should not keep his law. Moses started off as a mere shepherd who would eventually just people to the promised land. And this all done through the faith that he had. And that you can read about in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 23 through 29. Third individual was Gideon. Read about him in Judges chapter 6 through 8. And in a grim situation that he was in, an angel of God came to deliver a message to him. And God began revealing instructions to Gideon, bringing him ever closer to deliverance of Israel. And first he was to tear down the altar of Baal and cut down the grove of the goddess Asherah by it, then build an altar for the Lord and offer a sacrifice with the wood from the grove. Gideon took ten of his servants and did what the Lord commanded. The next morning, the men of the city found out and were ready to kill Gideon. And Gideon's father Joash defended his son's actions and made the men stand down. But then again, Gideon had asked for another sign. And Gideon received a lot of signs, but still not convinced, and he still was asking for another one. So when the Israelite men were assembled, God told Gideon that there were too many, that, the, they, that they would claim the victory of their own instead of giving God the glory. That night, Gideon gave each man a trumpet, a torch, and a clay jar. They surrounded the enemy camp with each torch hidden inside the jar. So at Gideon's signal, every man blew his trumpet and broke his jar. The confused Midianites turned on one another with the survivors fleeing the camp. Gideon and his courageous 300 men chased the Escapius and cut off their retreat. Now, the victory wasn't Gideon's, but it was the Lord's. 
And Israel then had quietness for 40 years for the remainder of Gideon's life. Once the Israelites were delivered from the oppression of the Midianites, they begged Gideon to be their king, but he had refused. He did not seek self-glorification, but rather the glorification of God. However, after Gideon's death, the people went back to the old pagan customs. And how many times have we seen this in the church? Fourth individual is David. God was with him throughout his life. And yes, he did mess up. But he was certainly with him when he fought Goliath. God was with David and was a man after his own heart. He had sinned many times throughout his life by committing adultery with Uriah's wife, Bathsheba. Then he tried to cover up his sin in different ways. Failing, and he had also murdered Uriah in war so that he could take Bathsheba to become his wife. It was all a scheme, it was all a plan that he was doing. But it wasn't going to lead to anything great in his life because throughout his life he struggled paying for his sins. But we read that the thing that David had done, of course, displeased the Lord. And when later on, when David came to his senses and realized what he had done, Nathan the prophet communicated God's words to David. David realized he sinned. He recognized it. And that's another thing we have to come to acceptance with, too. When we realize that we do sin, what do we do about it? And he prayed for forgiveness. And as we know... David is going to be in the kingdom because of everything that he learned. And through his examples, we can learn from them too. David was just a mere shepherd boy who then became a king. Now, the next four individuals have to do with the time of Christ. And these certain individuals played very important roles. Mary wasn't anybody famous. She wasn't popular. She wasn't an athlete. She was just a Jewish pheasant girl, a virgin, and God chose her to give birth to Jesus. And Mary was a direct descendant of King David, which gave Jesus the right to ascend the Jewish throne, both through Mary and through adoption by his foster father, Joseph. And you can see that in, in Luke chapter 3, verse 23 through 38 on Mary's genealogy. Matthew, before he became a disciple and the apostle of Jesus, he was a tax collector in Capernaum. And he left everything behind to follow Christ in Luke chapter 5, verse 28. Now at that time, the Jews viewed the tax collectors as sinners and treated them as outcasts who were to be avoided at all costs. Matthew, by grace, was afforded the opportunity to repent of a self-serving life, to then turn to God, to receive his saving grace and Jesus Christ. So if we look at ourselves, where we have come from, you know, we may not have the best background, the best jobs, whatever it may be, but if we are called in this life, something you really need to take personal, and there's a reason behind it. In Matthew's case, of all the jobs you could think of being a tax collector, Jesus saw something in him. Luke, he traveled with Paul, giving him a companion to journey with. And Luke would also write one of the four Gospels. But Luke was nothing more than a physician. Although a physician is a good job, but still. He was a physician, a regular one. But Luke set out to write down for him Theophilus, which is also in the book of Acts. And nothing is known about this man. But he may have been a Christian convert, or he was considering becoming one. For Luke stated that Theophilus had already been taught the gospel of Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 1, verses 4. And the historical account of the gospel of Jesus Christ to show he is a savior of the world. And an individual like this, who we don't hear much about, still has a big part especially when it came to Jesus Christ. You know, we, we may think we're insignificant being in the church or being called, but it's not. And you will see that. You know, many of the disciples were just common fishermen. 
and would go on to do God's work. Peter is the best example, as he would be an apostle, a leader of the early church, and he would write two letters in the Bible. But he still had much to learn, as his faith was tested many times. And we know about the incident with walking on the water, where Christ walked on the water in Matthew chapter 14, verse 28 through 31, where he had doubt where he started to sink. And also he denied Christ in Luke 22, verse 56 through 62, because of fear. But after the resurrection, Jesus appeared to Peter, after Christ's resurrection, that is, Jesus appeared to Peter at the Sea of Galilee and gave him his commission in John chapter 21. With Jesus no longer being there, disciples decided to go back to their old habits since they thought that the work was no longer. But Jesus asked Peter to continue to do the work. And no matter what happens with us, the work will always continue until Jesus Christ returns. To do God's work, you do not have to be famous. You don't have to be rich. You don't have to be good looking. None of the things that are considered important in the world are necessary to do God's work. Some of God's greatest workers have been regular people. If there is any piece that we can be closely related to on the chessboard, I would say that we in the church are the pawns. Those who are new in the faith are, exi are excited at first glance, and we see that. There's a lot of people who are interested, and they write us, and they are right away ready to get baptized. And oftentimes, it doesn't really lead to much because they forget about the things that they have to do first in order to get to there. That is a lifelong commitment. They want to jump in right away. As a first initial move, on a chessboard with a pawn. They have a choice to make by moving forward. They can either go with one space or they can go with two spaces. But then, one space at a time thereafter. So the very first move can be two spaces. So if you think of that analogy, people that are interested at first glance, they want to jump in quick right away. And then what happens is it slows down its baby steps until you get to the end. To defeat an opponent or an obstacle in our lives, as a pawn would have to do, you can only do it diagonally. It's not a straight on thing. If you, you hit the obstruction straight on, but you have to find a way to get around it. So it is very interesting how a pawn has to defeat its opponent by striking diagonally. If something is in the way, eventually that will be taken care of. Just like in our lives, we go through these obstacles. We continue to go forward but we do have to sometimes take a different path to get through. It's not an easy life, that's for sure, but it's not impossible either. We start off slow and we gain experience and wisdom as we mature in life and we learn more and more. The path of the pawn is to move forward. It is unable to go back and the same should go for us. Remember when we chose to follow Christ, when we were called to the truth, when we made the decision to be baptized. Let's look at that in Luke chapter 9, verses 57. Here you thought I wasn't going to give any scriptures at all. Well, Luke chapter 9 and verse 57. If we want if we're ready to live God's way of life, we better count the costs. It happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Then he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead but you go and preach the kingdom of God. Another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. Look, they're finding excuses 
They're finding, oh, let me, I have to do this first. The priorities are not correct. But Jesus said to him, verse 62, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Once we live for the kingdom of God, then everything, I mean everything, will be added to us, as it says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. But we still have a warning to consider. In Luke chapter 17, remember the obstacles that we are faced with, the trials that we go through. Luke 17, verse 22. And he said to the disciples, the days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, look here or look there, do not go after them or follow them. For as a lightning that flashes out of one part under the heaven shines to the other part under heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in his day. But first, he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. This is the generation in the time of Christ. But it also refers to, could refer to our generation. I mean, everything that we're going through, the sufferings that we're going through, that's not going to end. It's going to get worse and worse. As it was in the days of Noah, so it would be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives. They were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so, will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed? And in that day, verse 31, he who is on the housetop and his goods are on the house, let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. The key scripture right here is the next one, verse 32. Remember Lot's wife. Just like us, we strive and we continue to move in a forward direction, learning from mistakes we have made or done along the way by asking for forgiveness, running that race to reach our goal, which is our potential. We will then ultimately get to, to the goal that we are pursuing, to make it to the end, to defeat Satan, who is our opponent. Christ is the king on the chessboard, and it is our goal to become like him. We are to move forward in life, and we will hit obstacles along the way. The different paths in life that we encounter, yet our focus is still and always will be to move forward and to not look back.